Well, thank you for having me here tonight. Um, this was a, a really nice coincidence. Um, one of my friends from Pittsburgh, her, his uh, daughter was married in Oakland on Saturday, so we uh, got to spend the weekend at the Fairmont, which was, which was marvelous. Um, got to uh, my wife and daughter, actually uh, saw Tony Bennett, and got to say hi to him as they were going down the hall. And, um, Anyway, it's been, it's, been a, it's been a wonderful time and I'm grateful to be here. We're, tonight we're going to talk a little bit about uh, ethical leadership. I'm going to give you some uh, thoughts from a new book that uh, came off the press two weeks ago called The Business Ethics Field Guide that I've been working on for a while. Well, let's start with prophetic vision. It's a great place to start. In 1975, Spencer W. Kimball gave a speech at BYU entitled the Second Century Address. That's actually not the title, that's what it's become known as. So the Second Century Address. What year was BYU founded? 1875. 1875, knew we'd get it, exactly. So this, this address is um, a very important address because it's, it, in it, President Kimball sort of lays out the vision of BYU, what's it about? Why does the, why does the church spend so much money on BYU. And in that speech, he made the following statement, or at least I assumed he made the following statement. So when Kevin Worthen was installed as the new president of BYU two years ago, on his program, it had the quote that you're seeing behind me. And the quote, as you might imagine, as uh, the senior business ethics professor at BYU, I was pretty interested in this quote. President Kimball said, let the morality of the graduates of this university provide the music of hope to the inhabitants of this planet. That's an interesting quote. So I went and re reread the second century in address, and it wasn't there. <laughs> well, that's odd. So what did I do? What would you do? I Googled it. Exactly. I'm an old guy, but I Googled it. And I found that right after he gave the second century address, he then gave the dedicatory prayer for the Carillon Bells. So those of you who've been on the BYU campus and know the tower, the Carillon Bells, it was basically the church's gift to BYU for its centennial. So in the course of that dedicatory prayer, he says the line before this, just as these bells will provide beautiful music for the students at Brigham Young University. Let the morality of the graduates of this university. How many of that is you? How many, how many are a graduate of that university? Okay, most of you in here. Let your morality provide the music of hope to the inhabitants of this planet. Do you ever feel like we need hope in this world? This line always falls flat, but I just can't help myself. This election makes me think we need hope somewhere. Because <laughs> it sure isn't in this election. So my question for you then is, are you providing that hope to others? Do others look at you and go, you know, there is hope in the world. There are people who constantly try to do the right thing, who are working on it, not just kind of passively, but are actively trying to do the right thing and learning and growing so that they look at you and they go, even with everything falling out, falling down, all, you read the paper, right? I mean, the world is falling apart. But they think of you, and I forgot your name. Margaret, they think of Margaret and they go, you know what, there is hope in the world. The prophet of God said, we're supposed to provide, our morality should provide the music of hope. So that is really kind of cool. When I saw that, I've been trying for the last six years as the head of the ethics initiative of the Wheatley Institution to kind of come up with our vision. I read that and said, Done. I got a prophet who gave me the vision. I don't have to come up with a new one. In fact, I have three of my former students here. 
And I think two of them were probably with me when I figured this out. So this is M.C. Ingerson. M.C. got his Ph.D. working with me at, uh, at BYU. He's now a professor at San Jose State teaching business ethics. This is Chase Bradshaw. Chase was my uh, RA for three years. In fact, much of the work that I'm going to talk about tonight, both of these gentlemen were involved in and uh, made a lot of contributions to, so I'm grateful that they're, they're here tonight. Most students, you, at some point, you kind of lose track of. Fortunately, Chase, is, Chase and I are related. <laughs> he, 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 uh, he, his, wife, his wife's brother is married to my daughter. So that, that's kind of fun. And this is Rob Cook. He never worked for him, but he was in my class, one of my favorite students. I told him that tonight. He's like, I didn't believe you. You told that to all the girls. But that's not true. <laughs> Rob really was. So anyway, isn't that great? So the BYU uh, aims in terms of education are, number one, BYU education should be spiritually strengthening, intellectually enlarging, character building, leading to lifelong learning and service. President Worthen said in the fall devotional last year, I have sometimes thought that the character building part of those aims gets less attention than it should in our discussions. And yet those who established the vision for this university at the highest levels have made it clear that character building is at the core of what we do here. So what is the vision of the BYU Management Society that you are all engaged in? It's growing moral and ethical leadership around the world. This is a prophetic vision. So let me get personal. I came to BYU seven years ago. That was a difficult thing because my wife loved Pittsburgh. We raised our four children in Pittsburgh and she loved Pittsburgh. We lived in the ward that we had built the stake center across the street from our house. I was the first bishop of that ward and we were happy. My 15 year old daughter was entering her sophomore year of high school. She was born with three best friends. They were still her three best friends. But I believe in what Margaret Mead said. Margaret Mead was a very wonderful anthropologist who said the following, never doubt that a small group of committed individuals can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing it ever has. I remember when I read this quote for the first time, I thought, I'm kind of a, a bit of a historian. And so I kind of went back through history and sort of did a test on this statement. Is it a valid statement if you, if you go through history? It is, right? For good or for evil. You can trace almost any big movement or any big, you know, kind of activity to a small group of committed individuals. Well, I got thinking about it and I thought, who should that group of committed individuals be to raise the level of morality and ethics in the business world? Who should it be? Quite frankly, it wasn't going to be my, it wasn't going to be my um, faculty and students at BYU, even though they're wonderful, truly. I think one of the misnomers that people um, think of is that when I came to BYU, all of a sudden I had these wonderful ethical students, whereas the University of Pittsburgh, I didn't. I'm here to tell you they were almost identical. On almost any case, I can kind of tell you how many students will say do X, how many will say, do say Y, how many will say Z. Almost identical University of Pittsburgh and BYU. We are a product of our culture. But if there's anybody who should be raising it, shouldn't it be us? So I thought that would be kind of a fun challenge and they really wanted me to take on that challenge, so I moved. But that's us. We should be the small group of committed individuals to raise the level of ethics in the business world. Now this I just have to share because I love it. I don't have anything else to do with my presentation, I just love it. So Paulo Nia, who I'll talk about a little bit, he actually wrote a very nice forward to our book, former 72nd uh, Secretary of the Treasury of the United States and the former CEO of Alcoa, uh, was the uh, International Executive of the Year this past year at the Marriott School. And in there he said, I have three inviolate principles in leadership. Inviolate means you violate that principle, you're not part of my organization. I think, boy, I want to work in the organization that believes and lives these principles. So here is three principles. As a leader, he says, number one, every individual in the organization must be treated with complete and absolute dignity. 
by everyone else. If you don't treat other people with dignity and respect, you're out of my That's number one. Number two, every individual in the organization will have the tools, be it training, education, equipment, necessary to make a positive contribution to the organization that also brings meaning to their life. When you got up this morning, how many of you wanted to make a contribution to the world? Somebody woke up this morning and said, I don't want to really do anything good for the world today. <laughs> My guess is most of you got up and said, you know, I'd like to do something good for the world today. We want to make positive contributions. And the most demotivating thing in the world is to work in an organization where you don't think you can make positive contributions to the world. And so as he says, a leader's job is to make sure that everybody in their organization has what they need so that they can make a positive contribution to their organization. Because if we make a contribution to our organization when we come to work, that makes us feel good. Makes us feel like, as a person, I got to do what I wanted to do because I wanted to make a positive contribution in the world. So your job as a leader to make is to make sure that those people have what they need so that they can make that contribution. And number three, every individual in the organization this is an interesting one. I'm not sure I've ever seen an organization that actually meets this, but I love it. I think it's a great goal. Aspiration, right? So every individual in the organization will receive recognition for his or her contribution every day by someone else in the organization he or she respects. So it doesn't have to be the leader. The leader has to create the culture. How many of you like somebody recognizing your contribution. How expensive is that? So why don't we do it? I love it. So anyway, Paul O'Neill, three inviolate leadership principles, live them. Bob Oaks, a friend of mine, says, if you're going to be in the leadership business, you've got to like people. And he tells everyone, I learned how to be a leader from my mother who treated everyone else with the utmost respect and kindness. So I got to know Bob right after he retired as a four-star general. And uh, I remember having him come to my strategy class at the University of Pittsburgh. And by the way, strategy means general. That's, where, that's the root of the word. So I got four-star general, just head of US Air Forces Europe, coming to my strategy class talking about leadership, talking about strategy. And what does he say? I learned how to be a leader from my mother. That is true. So I want to tell, talk you a little bit about what we're doing at BYU to help you to actually accomplish the vision of creating or growing more ethical leadership around the world. Um, we've been doing a lot the last few years. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, deans who have understood how important it is that uh, we're very strong in ethics, you would think, well, BYU would, of course. Well, the reality is um, uh, a dean three deans ago said, I know we talk ethics, but we don't do anything. And it's time we do something. And uh, that's when, that's when uh, my time in Pittsburgh was up. We have six faculty who teach uh, ethics in the Marriott School. Uh, myself, Jeff Thompson, Dave Hart, Lori Wadsworth, Aaron Miller, and Brad Owens. Brad Owens and I are the two who teach it almost ex exclusively in our teaching. The others teach other subjects, but also teach business ethics. Um, until I came, there was zero. Now, at least there are two who only teach business ethics. But more than that, we have lots of other Marriott School faculty members who are interested in ethics. So Steve Albrecht, you may know, is the leading authority in the world in, in uh, anti-fraud efforts. Um, and uh, anyway, so lots and lots of folks who are really interested in it. And the goal of every business school is to integrate ethics throughout the entire curriculum. Nobody has accomplished it. We're working on it. We're still not there yet either, but we're working on it. I think it's possible at BYU. Every one of our programs has a required ethics class in it. That became true for the first time three or year, four years ago. Before that, there was at least one program that didn't have one. Every program has an ethics course in it. 
Business Week, last time, so MBA rankings come out every other day by somebody. For whatever reason, business ethics rankings don't come out all that often. Last one was 2003. That's why I showed the two's that, or 2013. You're like, what, what were they in 15 and 16? No, well, the last time they came out was in 13. At the undergraduate level, we, we were ranked number two. At the graduate level, we were ranked number eight. You may notice that Notre Dame is number one in both of them. So we've been working with Notre Dame. Uh, of course, BYU and Notre Dame has a six game football series. Um, we'll see if the other four happen. But uh, for the other two, we did uh, conferences with Notre Dame, at Notre Dame. Uh, wonderful, both presidents spoke at the first one, both athletic directors spoke at the second one, and how we develop virtue in our students. So the Marriott School has an ethics model. It says the foundation of ethics is virtue. It's the principles of honesty, truthfulness, fairness, respect. And we, in general, assume BYU students come with that. Now, we try to stick some rebar in that foundation, but in general, we sort of say, you sort of come with a lot of that already. We need to help you with this next level, which is to take those principles and apply them in the kinds of situations that you're going to face. So I'm going to talk about several situations tonight. My guess is you rarely talked about these situations in a Sunday school class and tried to figure out how the scriptures would apply to some of these. But it's absolutely critical because we know from psychology that there's something called the availability heuristic. The, avail the availability heuristic essentially says when you're faced with a problem, you go to the part of your mind that has tried to deal with that problem before and where you've actually got some kind of framework. So if you've got a business problem, do you go to Sunday school or do you go to your business school classes? Well, in general, you're going to go to your business school classes. So we don't necessarily help to create a, a, a pathway where you go, okay, I can understand how my gospel principles apply and how you know, that, that can help me in this, in this situation. So how do we apply those ethics? Next, when and how do we do things? So, how do we inculcate ethical courage? Because it's one thing to know what I should do, it's a whole other thing to know how to do it and to actually have the courage to do it. So we're going to talk about, well, what things keep us from doing what we need to do and how do we actually do what we need to do. And then finally, it's not just about us, right? We want to be the leaven in the loaf. We want to be the folks who help everybody. So how do we influence others for good. So that's essentially the Marriott School model that we're trying to build on. Uh, we have a wonderful website called ethics.byu.edu. We're in the process of trying to make it the best ethics website in the world. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. By that, we mean the best academic materials and the best materials for you to use. So I was kind of excited, actually. So my daughter, uh, my older daughter, had to give a talk on honesty and integrity in sacrament meeting a couple weeks ago. Which you think that, that would be easy because uh, she and her husband just moved from Mesa to Salt Lake and um, so they're actually temporarily living in our house. But it just happened my wife and I were in China and Thailand and India and so I wasn't there. And uh, she, she emailed me and said, I found this really neat talk by Rex Lee. You probably know about it. I'm like, yeah, go to ethics.byu.edu. And the very first thing under students you'll find is all the talks on ethics and integrity that have been given at BYU and in general conference. And she went and said, oh, that's really nice. That's really helpful. Well, if you have to give a talk on honesty and integrity, go to ethics.byu, look under students. The very first thing you'll find is all those wonderful materials. Well, we want to create that for everything. Uh, those are the four areas of the, uh, of the website. We do a biannual teaching ethics conference where I bring in the very best business ethics uh, and other ethics professors from Harvard, Yale, Stanford, etc. And then we have dozens of other professors who come and watch them teach a class. So I take about 15 BYU students, put them in the front of the class, and tell that professor from Harvard, come in and teach one of your favorite classes. And then there are 40 other students, professors standing around or sitting, sitting in the classroom watching this and learning. So the cool thing is if you want to see Tom Donaldson, the number one business ethicist of the world, who teaches at Wharton, if you want to see him teach, 
You have to go to the BYU website, because we, of course, have videotaped all of these. So if you want to see them from uh, Kirk Hansen from Stanford, now at Santa Clara, go to the BYU website. Now, unfortunately, you guys can't do it, sorry. It's only for professors and doctoral students. But I think we're going to change that soon. We're, in terms of licensing, we only said, you know, just do this so other professors can, can watch you teach. But most of them, I believe, will probably say, yeah, you can open it up to other people. Anyway, cool stuff. I told you about that. We do other things throughout BYU to uh, build, build our activities. Various publications, Business with Integrity. How many of you have come across Business with Integrity? Okay, so the rest of you need to find out about it. It's a wonderful volume put together in 2005 by the Marriott School. It's a collection of talks given by various uh, leaders at BYU. And it's got a foreword by, um, by Stephen Covey, which is terrific. Um, it's got a wonderful talk by Mitt Romney, another wonderful one by Bob Gay. and uh, It's a terrific volume called Business with Integrity. You ought to get it. Uh, Virtue in the Abundant Life, uh, that was put out by the Wheatley Institution, which I, by the way, I should thank. This is Silicon Valley after, after all. Jack Wheatley, the founder of Silicon Valley, of course, is, or excuse me, of the Wheatley Institution is from here. Um, I have to thank him. He's actually sponsoring my four-month speaking tour across the United States, which starts, which actually today's the first day of. Um, so I thank, the, I thank the Wheatley Institution. Uh, the Wheatley Institution, we put out a book called Virtue in the Abundant Life a few years ago, which is a nice read. Uh, my my uh, colleague, Jeff Thompson, wrote a book called Calling, specifically for LDS folks who are struggling to figure out what they're supposed to do in life. It's a really nice book. You're trying to figure out what your calling in life is. Um, my colleague, Paul Godfrey, wrote a really wonderful book about social entrepreneurship called More Than Money, Five Forms of Capital to Create Wealth and Eliminate Poverty. And uh, a few years ago, myself and several students put together a very academic book, which you don't want to read, <laughs> called The Research Companion to Ethical Leadership in Organizations, Constructs and Measures, which looks like that. But now here's a book you might want to read. The Business Ethics Field Guide is what I'm going to spend the rest of the evening talking about and the research uh, involved in it. I will say, um, we're, we're not selling books tonight, uh, but if you're interested, for the next week, we'll give you a $10 discount. Ethicsfieldguide.com is where you go to order the book, and if you put in the uh, discount code SILICON, uh, you'll get the book for $19.95 instead of $29.95 for the next week. Okay. The design. There's a reason for it. Does it look like a field guide? Does it look like a topo map? The field guide, rounded corners? It's actually very heavy. It's very so yes, Aaron Miller, my co-author, was really big on, he's big on design. And from the very beginning, he's like, we need to make it a field guide. Okay. And so yes, that's exactly why it looks the way it does. Okay. So speaking of Aaron Miller, there he is. Bill O'Rourke uh, is my other co-author, Bill. Uh, was a 40-year executive at Alcoa. He's wonderful. When I was uh, thinking about this book, Aaron Miller is actually the one that said, Brad, we need to write this book. I didn't really want to write a book, but Aaron convinced me. So here we are. As we were going through it, I said, you know what? Bill O'Rourke, who I have come, Bill is a wonderful guy. He uh, is a phenomenal speaker. He started being my, my guest speaker in 2000 at the University of Pittsburgh. In 2005, he got a new assignment as the president of Alcoa Russia. So Alcoa bought the Russian aluminum industry, about a billion dollar business. Two gigantic plants, in fact, the biggest plants in, in Alcoa. One in Samara, one in Belaya Kalitva. And he was there for the first three years. What do you think of when you think of business in Russia? Honesty, integrity, <laughs> forthrightness. It's not just no. abysmal, it's mining in Russia, which has at times had its ethical challenges. Yeah, you think of, yeah, I, I saw the cameraman going like this, <laughs> right? So, 
yeah, we think of bribery and corruption, etc., and there's good reason we think of that. Anyway, so he's, he, he went in and said, I will never pay a bribe. Guess what? He spent lots of time in airports. Because when you go through, what are you supposed to do? Pay a little bit, you go through the fast line. You don't pay, you get to spend some time in a room. And so he's got lots of stories about all the time he spent in airports and other places because he would never pay a bribe. Anyway, lots of, lots of cool stories. Um, in 2009, when I went to BYU, I was, one of the things I was bummed about was that I'm going to lose my get, best guest speaker because Bill had no reason to go to Utah, no reason to go to BYU, no connection. I called him up and said, Bill, would you fly out to Utah and speak to my students? He said, yeah, sure, love to. So he comes every semester to BYU, spends three or four days. I work him to death. I have him teach like 10 classes in three days. So a phenomenal guy, and I told Aaron, it's like, listen, if we're going to write this book, we have to have Bill's stories in this book. And whether anything I wrote or Aaron wrote has any value, you'll want to, write the, you'll want to buy the book for Bill's stories. Well, if you talk ethics, you've got to have some fun. You've got to have a sense of humor about it. So here they are in the boardroom. Mrs. Johnson will now pass out the moral blinders. Hopefully that's not your boardroom. Here are these two guys in jail saying, I don't understand. All along, I thought our level of corruption fell well within community standards. And then finally, my last one, uh, and my favorite, this is Wiley Watson. He's our controller and vice president of balance sheet special effects. <laughs> oh, the accountants love it, right, Rob? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, there's a lot of literature on leadership. In fact, you go into any bookstore and you're going to find dozens and dozens of books on leadership. Abe Zelesnik wrote a classic back in Harvard Business Review in the 70s where he talked about the difference between leadership and management. And he said every organization needs both. Very few people are good at both, but every organization needs both. There are a few people who are really good leaders and good managers, but most people, if you're, you've got to figure out which one you are and then make sure you've got somebody else who's good at the other one. So, the leader's job is to motivate people, to create the vision of the organization, make sure that everybody is rowing in the same direction, understands where our, what our goal is, and creates it in such a way that it's exciting for people. They actually want to get to the destination. So this person's got to make sure you know, that he or she is talking about the values of the organization, the destination of the organization. Generally, it requires change, and so that person has to be a change leader motivating people. So that's a leader. Meanwhile, every organization needs management. Not only do you need change, you need stability. So, In Search of Excellence, right? A great book back in the 80s. Peters and Waterman. Well, Tom Peters. Tom Peters is a character. You've seen those uh, days where they have sort of all the top business leaders or not uh, management thinkers, you know, talk and then everybody comes to an arena and, he, and listens to them and then they, you know, they satellite it to lots of other places. Well, Tom Peters was one of those speakers. They did that and uh, they were satelliting it to uh, Morgantown, West Virginia. And so our business school was a uh, sponsor. And so there was a portion in it where the local folks were supposed to take over for an hour and lead a discussion. Then there's back to, I don't know where it was coming from, Dallas or something. And so our dean was going to do that. In the morning we, sh we show up. I don't know why he went, I don't remember. I went because I guess I was interested for some reason. I show up and the staff is there helping out. And the staff says, oh my gosh, we just got a call from the dean. I think somebody in his family died. He can't come. What are we going to do for that hour where we're in charge? Huh, staff, 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 faculty. Guess who got to deal with that one? Okay, so 
Tom Peters is up there. And if you've ever seen Tom Peters, I mean, he has got more energy. He is everywhere. He is just, you know, got you interested. And he is spitting. You don't want to be in the, you know, in the wet zone in the front because you're going to, because Tom Peters, he's got so much excitement and Tom Peters is just going on and he's saying, every organization has to change. You got to change. Nobody can agree with each other because you got to change. Because if you don't change, you're going to die. You're going to be a dinosaur. You're going to be, yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's Tom Peters. And he says to us for like 45 minutes. And I'm sitting there going, what a bunch of crock, what a crock. It's like, yeah, you need change, but it's like, you can't, you ever try to have an organization where nobody agreed with each other? Where there's no stability whatsoever? It's like, that doesn't work. But he's Tom Peters and I'm looking at him, you know, I got a few thousand people and they're all like, yeah, it's Tom Peters. So I get up there and I say, so what did you think of what Tom Peters had to say? They're, oh yes, yes, everybody has to change. We can't everybody agree in the organization. Anyway, okay. <laughs> so according to, according to Tom Peters, you don't have to have any management, but according to most other folks, you actually have to have management. You have to have budgets, you have to have schedules and all those kinds of good things. And it's really critical. The other thing that we find that most people haven't focused on, though, is a third skill, and that's the one we're going to talk about tonight, which is the skill of ethics. Have you ever thought of ethics before as a skill? You have. Good for you. Most people haven't. Most people think of ethics as motivation, right? Have your heart right. I want to do the right thing. That's wonderful. So let me tell you a couple of stories. Both Pennsylvania stories about two incredible leaders. One, Paul O'Neill, who I already mentioned, is in Violet Principles. And the other one, football coach, Penn State, Joe Paterno. Now, Joe Paterno could have been the governor of Pennsylvania any time he wanted to while I lived there. All he had to say is, I'm running for governor, he'd have been governor. Right? Early in his time at Penn State, some players had done some things that were wrong. And he was still, you know, very new coach. And he brought him in and basically said to everybody in the team, listen, we either do it right or right now, if you don't want to follow the rules, walk out. Pretty brave for a new coach. Well, people didn't walk out. And he then ran one of the most ethical football programs in the country. They followed the rules. They won championships. Joe Paterno was absolutely beloved in the state of Pennsylvania. In fact, they put up a nice statue of him outside of the football stadium in State College. Okay, switch over now to Bill O'Rourke. Now, excuse me, not Bill O'Rourke, Paul O'Neill. Paul O'Neill becomes the CEO of Alcoa, and he says the most important thing about our organization is going to be safety. Safety. That's our number one value. That is our number one priority. He says, I happen to believe if we, if we manage to create a safety culture, it'll also be good for everything else. But the very first number one priority for us is safety. And he used to crack people up. He'd go to Wall Street. He'd go to analyst meetings. What do you expect the analysts to be asking you about? Well, you know, price for share and your earnings, you know, all that kind of stuff. And he started off the meeting and said, now I noticed when we came in here that there are two exits. There's one over here and there's one back there in case we have a fire. And I went down the hall and about 50 feet down the hall is where the stairwell is if we need to go down. And another 20 feet past that, there's a fire extinguisher. You know, like, who is this guy? But he said, every meeting starts, is going to start with safety. Every single agenda in our company will start with safety. Well, a little while after he became CEO, uh, he was told by some Benedictine monks that they had a problem, or excuse me, Benedictine nuns, they had a problem in their plant in Acuna, Mexico, that there had been some folks who had been poisoned. And uh, Paul said, no, I don't believe that. 
because in our company we have a requirement that any time there's a significant safety violation, I'm told within 24 hours, and I didn't hear about this. Well, Paul's smart. Afterwards, he checked it out. He said, go find out about this. And he found out there had, in fact, been an incident. About 200 people had been sickened. They later figured out it was because of a diesel. They'd had an inversion, and they had a diesel forklift. And the fumes had, because of the inversion, had stayed there, and people had been sickened. And they checked, and they found that, sure enough, there was a report. But if you read the report, it sounded like they had had an open house for the emergency personnel to come and see them. So Paul found out that um, the executive vice president, who by the way was the most successful person who worked for him, this gentleman had taken his business unit from a hundred million to a billion in three years. Pretty tough to do. Oh and by the way, it also had the best margin, profit margin of any business unit in the company. Found out he's the one who kind of, you know, made the report sound like not quite accurate. So now what do you do as business leader? By the way, this guy's a great guy. People in the organization love him. He's been known for doing the right thing. Paul fires him. Not only does he fire him, he fires him in the Wall Street Journal, in an editorial. And he says, all the wonderful things about him. Says this guy's a great guy. He talks about all the wonderful things he did for Alcoa. But he said, if I don't let him go, the message will be sent to Alcoa employees that safety is not as important as financial performance. And I cannot have that happen because safety is our most important value. Well, it was several years later that Alcoa became the safest company in the world. They beat out DuPont, which had been the safest company forever. It's a whole other story to that. I just happened to be in Paul's office when his secretary came in with the numbers from the government. He was like a kid in a candy store. It's like, we just beat DuPont. Paul went on to have an incredibly successful career at Alcoa. Alcoa did become the safest company in the world. They also were incredibly profitable. You wanted to be a shareholder under Paul O'Neill's time at, at Alcoa. Back to Joe Paterno. So some of you know this story. There were some accusations of one of his assistant coaches in terms of uh, sexual abuse of, of boys. And Joe Paterno was like, well, this is, this is bad. Um, what should I do? And, and he looked and said, the university has a protocol, and I'm supposed to report it to this person. And so I reported it to that person. He's like, I don't know what to do with this. So he reported it. University didn't do anything. So it just kind of continued on. Until finally it broke, and there were lots of accusations, and um, you know, this person was then convicted of lots and lots of terrible acts to young boys. People said, wait a second, Joe Paterno knew about this? What did he do? Joe said, I did exactly what I was supposed to do. I told the university. I thought about doing more, but I didn't really know what, what, I, what I should do, etc. What happened to Joe Paterno? Okay, he died about a year after that. In the interim, what happened? He got fired. They pulled down the statue. Yeah, vacated his victories. I mean, here's a guy who spent his life trying to do the right thing. And in the end, his reputation was just sh completely shot. He died really a very, very sad figure. Was it because of his intentions? It was skill. He didn't have the skill. Paul O'Neill had the skill set. Joe Paterno didn't. Joe Paterno didn't understand the gravity of what he was dealing with. He also didn't understand that when you have great power, you all know Superman, with great power comes great responsibility. Right? So the irony is 
that if he had not been Joe Paterno, he probably would have been in better shape. The fact that he had so much power, people expected more of him. And he didn't understand that. He didn't have the skill set to understand that when you have that much power, people expect more from you. So the message is that if you want to be a great ethical leader, it can't just be, oh, it's something I want to do and I have this wonderful intention. It's like any other skill. You have to develop it. If Joe Paterno had studied a little bit more, he might have understood that when you have more power, people expect you to do more. And you're not going to be able to skate by on I followed the rules. I did, you know, the basics of what I was supposed to do. So, how many of you watch the Olympics? Some people are too busy. <laughs> My wife loves the Olympics, and I'm, I, you, you might have, I think you mentioned, I don't know if you mentioned or not, I'm on, the, I'm on the ethics advisory, what is it called? The Ethics Committee of USA Synchro. So there's a story behind that, but anyway. So I care about synchronized swimming, I watch synchronized swimming. <laughs> My, my son, uh, younger son, was a gymnast, so we t tend to pay attention to gymnastics. What do you think it takes to do a double flip in the pike position? Anybody do, can do that? Anybody do that? You can do that? No problem? Yeah, right? Okay. Yeah, you just can't do it because you want to do it. It requires knowledge, it requires practice, it requires efforts. And, and the same thing here. All right, so what do we need to learn? Let me first give you just a few examples of, of some value conflicts or uh, ethics. So uh, a BYU senior interviews for a job he'd love to have in his hometown in uh, North Carolina. Interview goes well, but no job offer comes. Meanwhile, he gets another job um, offer or a job offer in Kansas City. He accepts the offer and then the company in North Carolina comes back to him unexpectedly and offers him a job. 10000 more than he was going to make at the other job, and it's his hometown. What should he do? Hmm. What was that? Cry. Cry. Okay, there's a good answer. Okay. Um, one of my favorite cases, you're a division manager, you have a bicycle division, you're part of a big company, and the CEO of the company says, we're going to get rid of your division, you're not making enough money, you're making money but not enough and we want to take the money from your division and move it into other divisions that are more profitable and so we're going to stop manufacturing bicycles here in a few months and then sell the inventory. But we don't want anybody because if we do that then the inventory will re be reduced in value because people don't want to buy things that are going out of business, right? So you as a consumer, you're not going to pay as much for something that's going out of, uh, out of business. So he said, but I don't, want people, I don't want the consumers to find out about that. And will you say, well, we have a supplier who's actually building parts for our bicycle, and we already have three months' supply. So anything they're building tomorrow is going to be useless. And your CEO says, well, do we have a contract with them? He said, no. He said, well, then don't tell them. Said, well, if they keep building, these parts will be worthless, and we'll, they'll, be, they'll go out of business, and their town will be destroyed. Your CEO says, that's their problem. Oh, and by the way, you signed an NDA. You signed a non-disclosure agreement. You can't tell anybody anything. What are you going to do? You, you work closely with the supplier. You talk to the supplier every few days. You're the head of internal audit for a large company. Your company recently passed, and I, I actually, uh, an external audit, and it also uh, passed an internal audit. However, in the process of that internal audit, they found that in the biggest currency hedge in the history of the company, $7 billion currency hedge, they were going to do an acquisition, so they did a currency hedge for the company that was in a different country. They did not follow segregation of duties. Now, I'm not an accountant, so I didn't understand all that well, but now I've, been, I've learned accounting a little bit, and I understand segregation of duties and the importance of segregation of duties. I'm looking at my accounting friends here. And they didn't follow the segregation of duties. And so he said, this is a really bad thing. But everything else they did was pretty good, and so they barely passed the internal audit. You're the head of internal audit. You know this. Every quarter, you report to the board of directors, the audit committee of the board of directors. 
technically you don't have to tell them about this. You know darn well the CEO doesn't want you to tell them about this. What do you do? Okay, so I'm talking about the field guide tonight. What, what this book does is it's got four chapters in the back, section two, which are the fundamentals of ethics. So it's got a, a chapter that tells us about behavioral ethics. There's a whole big field now of psychologists and sociologists helping us understand why we do unethical things when we think we're good people. And so I have a chapter sort of summarizing the basics of that. I have another chapter, sort of what I call 3,000 years of philosophy and theology in a few pages. All the sort of fundamental ways we think about what's ethical. I've got a chapter on ethical leadership for those who are in formal leadership positions, the kinds of things you should be doing in your organization to create an ethical culture. And I've got a chapter on being ethically proactive, all the things that you should be doing before you ever get yourself in an ethics situation. Okay? There are lots of things that you can do that if you, when you find yourself in these situations, you'll be able to handle them and deal with them much better than if you hadn't done those things. So those are the four chapters at the end in section two. The, the base, the, 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 the larger part, section one, is the 13 dilemmas. And for each one, we have different stories. And then we have a series of questions that help you think through that particular question. So if you've got one where you go, should I intervene here? Should I not intervene? You go to that chapter, and here's several questions that help you think about, in this situation, should I intervene or not intervene? Business is kind of like a wilderness. You go out there and if you, you, know, you're, you see beautiful things. There are one, lots of wonderful experiences out in the business world. A lot of beautiful vistas. Some of you might recognize the backside of, of uh, Mount Timpano, and you might recognize Chase's sister-in-law and brother-in-law. And uh, you might recognize the top of Timp. That's looking over Utah Lake. Beautiful vistas. Who knows what that is? That's Iguazu, okay? So Iguazu, where Brazil and Argentina and Paraguay come together. It's gorgeous. I've taken all these pictures. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. And some of you uh, go to this recurring movie every now and again. Um, you'll see it in that, in that movie as well. Uh, this is uh, the Great Barrier Reef. And that's me on my 50th birthday uh, being excited about climbing to the top of Mount Timpanogos. And... Um, Two nights ago, uh, I had this experience. So why did I take this picture? Okay, there's Steph Curry. I met him two nights ago in Oakland. Kind of an exciting thing. You're just getting out there. You never know who you're going to meet. Okay? But there are dangers when you're out there in the wilderness. Right? There are bears. You might get altitude sickness. There are snakes. You might, you know, sprain an ankle. So there are dangers out there, just like there are dangers in the business world. Uh, I took this picture in South Africa. I just happened to get lucky as the great white was coming out of the, coming out of the water to get that shot. I was, uh, I was um, cage diving with my son. That was a lot of fun, having great white swimming around you. Uh, a few days later, we were in Kruger National Park, and we, we parked in the middle of the road as this pride of lions was coming down the road at us. My son was 17 at the time, and one of the big rules at Kruger National Park is you have to have your windows rolled up. Well, my 17-year-old son didn't have his window rolled up. So I'm saying, Christian, roll up your window. And the lions are getting closer, and he's being a 17-year-old. He's not listening to Dad. And I'm trying not to go, Christian, roll up your window! You know, get the lions all excited, right? So I'm just like, Christian, roll up your window. He won't do it. The lions come right by. Two on the right side, they come right by his side. Two on the left, come right by my side. As they're coming by, I said, Christian, do not pet the lion. <laughs> Fortunately, he did not. <laughs> and he lived to tell it, and I'm still alive. Although I did see a news article about three months ago that, sure enough, somebody in Kruger National Park had their window down and the lions got him. So there are lots of dangers out there. But there's also manuals that tell us how to deal with those dangers. Right? So... We live in California. There are black bears and grizzly bears in California, correct? Not so many black ones? Not so many grizzlies? No, no more grizzlies in... in uh, isn't the grizzly on the flag? Yeah, it is. Well, that's the California grizzly. But it's a grizzly. But it's not the same. Oh, it's not? Okay, never mind. Okay. But in general, there's, there's black bears and, and, and grizzlies. 
I'm going to get the finer points later on from Rob. I'll refine this presentation. Um, <laughs> so, how do you survive a bear attack? Depends on the bear. Depends on the bear, right? So the first thing you have to do is you have to be able to identify the bear. Well, that's what this book helps you do. So what we did in our research is I've got, thou I've got thousands of ethical dilemmas my executive MBAs have done. And I found through my research that there are 13 fundamental ethical dilemmas. When you boil it right down, there are 13 of them. I'm going to talk about those in a minute. So you have to be identi identify what, what, what bear are you dealing with. So you have to know, well, if it's got a big hump on the back, that's a grizzly. grizzly. If it's darker, that tends to be a black bear. If it's a little lighter in color, it tends to be a grizzly. Which one's bigger? Grizzly. Grizzly's bigger. Okay, so okay, I've identified the type of bear I'm facing. If it's a black bear, what do I want to do? I want to get big, right? Ah! I want to scare it, because a black bear can be like a raccoon. They're scared. They'll run away, throw rocks at them, you know, get big, scare them. What happens if you do that with a grizzly? You're That's a bad idea. <laughs> bad, bad idea. Right? If it's a grizzly, you want to curl up, play dead, and hope, and pray. Right? So the strategy will be different depending on what kind of challenge or bear you're dealing with. In the same way in business ethics. So here are the 13 fundamental ethical issues you're going to deal with. Number one, and most common, being asked or told to do something by someone in an authority position relative to you. Generally a boss, but sometimes a client or a customer, etc. Most common ethical dilemma. Number two, deciding how to act when you have two roles whose interests collide. Okay, conflict of interest. Probably the one that most people don't get. They just don't get conflict of interest. All you have to do is watch this presidential election, you realize people don't understand conflict of interest. And consequently, they don't manage it well. Number three, sometimes you suspect that something is going wrong, but you don't have the evidence. And so how you decide to go about investigating is really tricky. Because if you go too hard at it, people think, oh, well, she's guilty because they're investigating this, and she may not be guilty. But it may be something where if you don't do anything, then it's a terrible thing. You do the Joe Paterno thing. Number four, sometimes you make a promise and then the world changes. What does that mean for my promise? So, should you keep your promises? Basic ethics. This is not a hard question. I got hard questions. That's not one. Okay, right? In general, you should keep your promises. That's a basic fundamental duty, ethics right? But unfortunately, in life, we make lots of promises. It's just a fundamental part of life. In fact, the interesting thing about it is the most important promises we make tend to be nonspecific, right? So a specific promise is, you know, I will have your report to you by 7 o'clock tomorrow morning. Or, you know, we'll go out to dinner Friday at 6 o'clock, right? Very specific promises. But the most important promises we make tend to be ambiguous. Give me an example of some of the more important promises you make in life. Okay, that may or may not be important. I think it's really important that you tell your, your spouse whether or not you're going to take them somewhere. Be, be committed. Oh, okay, so that Friday at 6 o'clock for your spouse, that's an important one. That's important. The boss, forget about that. But the, the spouse, now there, now we're talking. Okay, but I'm talking about really, really important promises you've made. Most, most of you have made these promises, but they're really not specific. What? I got your back. I got your back, okay. I'm thinking about very specific promises. Marriage, right? Marriage. Marriage, that's a pretty important promise, right? We got an LDS audience here. <laughs> Even if it's not an LDS audience, most people consider marriage to be pretty darn important promise, right? To love cherish, honor. What does that mean for you next week at 4 o'clock? Or five years from now? You don't know. In fact, one of the interesting things about marriage is basically a pooling of risk. About 10 years ago, my wife was diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Did that change my life? It did. 
Right? So, she's not the same person I married. She's still wonderful. But now she has this thing where, you know, sometimes she's not feeling well, sometimes we can't do things. So, we don't know whether when you get married, it might be that, you know, you have a spouse who, if you say, I love you once a month and give a high five, they're happy. Or they may get a disease or something where you have to care for them 24 7. Baptism, another one, sort of ambiguous, you know, what it means in particular situations. And sometimes those commitments actually end up coming in conflict with very specific promises you make. So then how do you balance those? Number five, sometimes you're tangentially involved in something, but you're not directly involved. Under what circumstances should you get involved? When do you say, I need to do something? Versus, you know, this is not my thing. Sometimes your job requires you to sacrifice personal values or relationships that are not general to the public. I'm going to give an example on this here in a minute. No. Oh, no, 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 no. No. So that one is not an ethical dilemma. Ethical dilemmas are where there are two conflicting duties. That one was just simply wrong. <laughs> okay, breaking the law for, to, for your own advantage is simply wrong. It's, not a, it's, an ethic, it's an ethics issue, but it's not an ethical dilemma. So if you just see them together, it was illegal? Oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about the, the, the person who saw them. Yeah. Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I didn't understand. Yes. Absolutely. So that person had to decide, should I do something? Yeah, absolutely. So that person wasn't directly involved. In this case, yeah, the, he, he said, those two probably, if they're together in this private setting, there may be something going on. But he didn't know that. So yes, I'm sorry. That's exactly right. Um, so this one uh, I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a minute. Sometimes you've done something wrong. Or you're accountable for something going wrong. How do you deal with that? Do you follow the Ryan Lochte method? <laughs> Probably not a good idea. So I'm going to give you a little, a little tip. There's this wonderful website called perfectapology.com. It's a great website. It's a terrific website. Go use it tells you how to apologize, when it should be in person, when you need to write it, what are the five elements of a perfect apology. It's a terrific website, perf perfectapology.com. Okay? So, for anybody who's married, it's great. Anybody who has relationships with other people, it's great. Anybody who works in a job, it's a great website, perfectapology.com. Okay. Oh, education. I'm a professor. I have to give quizzes. Okay? So here's your quiz. How many of you, by a show of hands, know the meaning of the word dissemble? Now, I hope my students do. Okay. So my students do, and a couple of other people, and our, our president here heard me last year. Did you know before then? No. Okay. So we're making progress. This is part of my personal mission is people to help learn this word. So you know, the, you know the meaning of this word. Okay. Hold it. By the way, this word is not disassemble. It's dissemble. So, if you know what I'm about to say, join with me, okay? We'll love one another and never dissemble, but cease to do evil and never be one. How many of you sung that? <laughs> now, the song of the righteous is a prayer unto me. So, it sounds like you've been saying a prayer that you will never do this thing, that most of you have no idea what it is that you're never going to do. Would you be interested in knowing it, what it is you're saying you're never going to do? <laughs> yeah? Okay. So, you know what it is. Tell us, what does dissemble mean? You're, you're not lying, but you are being very creative in how you are presenting fragments of truth. Okay. Very good. So, dissemble means to make something appear different than it actually is. There are many ways we can dissemble. We can dissemble through what we say, through what we don't say, 
through what we allow other people to kind of believe, by what we show. There are a whole bunch of ways. I like the word because a lot of people think that being honest means not lying. And I tell, tell people, no, only dumb people have to lie. It's like smart people can figure out how to be dishonest without lying, right? <laughs> through what you don't say, through special ways of saying things. But the song is saying, no, it's about being honest. So dissemble is the opposite of, think of another word that has semble in it. You and your brother resemble each other. To resemble means to look like something. Dissemble means to make look different from something. So it means to disguise or conceal behind a false appearance, to make a false show of something, to feign, to disguise or conceal one's real nature, motives, or feelings behind a false appearance. What do you do when there's an unfair advantage? I.e., your brother happens to be in the state legislature and you know, can get a bill through that would help your company. It's like, mm. and, and I've got lots of other examples of that. Number nine, sometimes organizational rules get in the way of you doing important work. This, by the way, is a very uh, common one at BYU, which is kind of interesting. It's like, you know, like, I got this rule that says I have to do this, but you know, I can't get the good work that we need to get done if I follow that rule. So when do you not follow the rule? Um, deciding when to provide mercy. Um, I, have a, I have a friend who had uh, one of his employees come in one, one morning. This uh, woman who'd worked for him for 10 years was a wonderful employee, and she had alcohol in her breath. He's like, whoa. And this company had a no tolerance policy. Someone's been drinking, you have to tell, and they are fired. And he said, you've been drinking. And she broke down in tears and said, yeah, my husband just left me. He's been abusing me. He just left me. And I just, yeah, I, I had a couple of drinks before coming, coming to work. What do you do? Do you provide mercy? Do you follow the rules? So, Greg, James McGregor Burns. Using questionable means to bring about justice. This is the hardest one. When do you lie, cheat, and steal to bring about justice, to bring about a good end? Right? Generally we say, well, we shouldn't lie, cheat, steal, but every now and again we say you should shoot somebody. Yeah, you should actually drop bombs on somebody sometimes. Normally we don't think that's very ethical, but under certain circumstances. So the favorite example of the philosophers is during World War II you're hiding some Jews in your house. And you're a really good architect and engineer, and so you've got multiple walls, and you've got false doors, and you've got tunnels, and no way is anybody ever going to find those folks. And the SS officer comes, knocks on your door, and says, do you have any Jews in your house? And you say, well, yes, of course we do. <laughs> yeah, you go back here, make a left, then you make a right, then you go through a false door, and then you go through the tunnel, and you'll find them. How many think you should lie in that situation? Okay, so in general, you know, are you honest in your dealings with your fellow men? I had a CIA agent in my ward in Pittsburgh. It's like, how the heck is he supposed to answer that question? Right? I mean, his whole life is about deceiving other people. Deciding when it's appropriate to dissemble. Every now and again, even though the song says we should never do it, it actually is under circum certain circumstances, like when someone says, sir, you are a new bishop and you just got called, what do you say? Uh, 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 hmm, I, uh, I don't know, um, hmm, no, uh, that's a lie, uh, that's dissembling. Um, did you get that promotion at work? Uh, you have to dissemble. You can't come out and say, well, I gotta tell you the truth. Yes, I did, you're not supposed to. Finally, deciding how much loyalty to give. There's a certain amount of loyalty you need to give but there also comes a point where you give too much loyalty to people. So how do you, how do you draw that line? Um, I'm going to give you this case and then wrap up. So a few years ago, I'm sitting in my office in Pittsburgh, and I get this package, and it's a whole bunch of Omaha steaks. It's like, cool, but why would somebody be sending me Omaha steaks? So I look on this thing, and it, it uh, came from Dow Jones. Why would Dow Jones be sending me Omaha steaks? And then I remembered, oh yeah, Dow Jones owns the Wall Street Journal. It doesn't anymore, but it did back then. 
And I happen to be the person in the Katz Graduate School of Business who made the decisions about which publication the school would buy for all of our faculty and students. And I had made the decision we'd buy the Wall Street Journal. So I was using my organization's funds. I was making the decision how those would be spent for all of our faculty and students. So this was a thank you. And my wife loves steaks. But I think of what? 13 dilemmas. I didn't have them back then, but I knew what it was. Which one of the 13 dilemmas did I have? Oh, this is the one that I tell people don't get. All right, my star pupil there. Good job. Conflict of interest. Okay? So, Brad Agle, husband of Christy Agle, wants those steaks. Brad Agle, representative of the Katz School, says, wait a second, I should make sure I'm objective in my decisions about who gets these, because I'm going to make the decision again next year. I don't want anyone ever suggesting that Brad Agle decided the Wall Street Journal instead of the Financial Times or Economist because Brad Agle is getting some free gift. So I went and looked up on, on the uh, internet, say how much are these things worth? They're worth like 250, 300 bucks. It's a lot of good stakes. It's like, well, that's more than nominal. So then I thought, well, does our organization have a policy? So I looked up the, nothing. No policy, or University of Pittsburgh didn't have a policy. So I thought, well, I'll go to my boss. So I go up to the dean's office and he, his secretary said, oh, he just left. Oh, by the way, he got one of those boxes at stakes as well. <laughs> as he was leaving, you mentioned he was going to have a barbecue for his friends this weekend. <laughs> okay, well, what should I do? What should I do? Anyway, because uh, we're short of time, the answer was the stakes went to um, the food, food bank. And I wrote a letter to Dow Jones saying, please don't send me gifts anymore because I want to be completely objective. All right, so we get lots of these kinds of ethical dilemmas. So for each of these, we have a set of questions in the book. So for the conflict of interest, are there any clear rules? Well, in my case, there weren't. A lot of times there are. In fact, I've helped some people who are dealing with conflict of interest, and I said, well, does your organization have any rules? And they're like, I don't know. Went and looked it up on the website, and it's like, oh, our organization does have rules. Oh, they're very helpful to me. So sometimes your organization rules actually has rules that'll help you. Um, would your actions cause others to question your motives? Who has a right to know the details and you have, have you let them know? Is there a way to remove yourself in particular ways to avoid the conflict of loyalties? Have they done or could they do anything to free you from your obligation to them and what should I do now to avoid conflicts in the future? I would love to give these questions to both our presidential candidates. <clears throat> uh, lots of other examples, we're out of time, um, but I hope that you have been also so blessed in your life. Thank you. We're going to end now. I'll take more questions, but I want to end, and we'll take a minute pause for anybody to leave who has to leave so you don't feel embarrassed, and then I'll be happy to take a few more minutes and answer any, any other questions. So thank you very much.